Hey guys, it's Chris. How you doing today? It's my good pleasure to help people lead a life more pleasing to God, so I'm making this video tonight. This video tonight is called 10 Reasons That Believers Are Stuck in Their Sin. And this is very important because even one of these reasons will keep you stuck in your iniquity, stuck in sin. And just one sin can grieve God enough to keep you out of heaven if you're walking in that sin and you will not repent and you're stiff-necked about coming out of that sin. So, I want everyone to pay attention. The first one is, many do not deal with the root of bitterness. This is very, very important. This, this creeps up on people and eats away at them until basically... There's no return for someone that wants to turn themselves over to bitterness. Resentment's a big part of it. Anger's a big part of it. Hebrews 12:14 says, "Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man fail the grace of God, lest a root of bitterness spring up and trouble you." and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. How many people... If you're a believer, how many people have you seen eaten alive by bitterness? How many people have you, have you seen turn on their birthright in the Lord and turn on their ministry, turn on their inheritance? I've seen many, many people do this. It says here, Esau sought repentance carefully with tears and could not find it. So it's very important not to let bitterness rise up in you. Because it leads to greater sin and it defiles many. Okay? The second issue that keeps people stuck in their sin is they don't love or fear God. If you don't love or fear God, you're in big trouble. Because these two factors keep you anchored into righteousness. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now this is the lump sum total of the book of Ecclesiastes. The whole entire book calls pretty much anything that exists on this earth and any endeavor you have, pure vanity. And then at the end of the book, it says that this is all that matters in this world. This is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's the conclusion of all things. From the beginning of my walk, I've made that the, the foundation and the, the focus of my entire walk with God. And I've, had, I've hit bumps in the roads, but because that was my foundation and that was my focus, God has pulled me out of every hurdle all the way up until now. John 4, 15 to 16. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, and that comforter will abide with you forever. So it's clear here that we need to love God. Jesus directly says, if you love him, you will keep his commandments. The book of Ecclesiastes says, fear and obey God is key. So those things, obedience is tied into both loving and fearing God, both. Okay, and that's all throughout the Bible. Number three, people do not hate sin and they enjoy pleasure. This is basically selfishness. That's the problem. That's number three. 2 Thessalonians 2.11 and 12. 
And for this cause God shall send many a strong delusion that they will believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The Bible talks about people who will not turn to righteousness because they simply love filth. They love vomit. They love sin. These people will not inherit eternal life by any means. No matter how great your, you think your faith is, if you had faith in Jesus Christ and his word, you would follow this right here. Hebrews 11, 24, and 26. By faith, here again tying in faith, by faith when he has come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Again, this is Moses. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So this connected the pleasures of sin for a season with deciding to hang out with your rich family and all that stuff. This connected all that together. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. So right here it's clear, seeking wealth in no way is a good excuse to turn your back on the reproach of Christ, right? Seeking family is not an excuse by any means. Number four, people deny the, regenerating, the regenerating power of God. If you deny the regenerating power of God, then you will remain in your sin. Okay? This is a big reason people remain in their sin. They feel that their one-time confession of Christ is the lump sum total of what needs to happen in their life as a believer. They deny the power of God. I've just made a few videos on this independent Baptist, faith alone believers, other cheap grace believers, people like Joseph Prince, all these people. Now Joseph Prince is slick on it, but he's basically a cheap, cheap grace preacher. But they deny the regenerating power. 2 Timothy 3, 3 to 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. So this goes and ties into number three, where people love their sin. Okay? They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. From such, turn away. And this will connect with another one I'm going to read about turning away from these people. Something people do to remain in their sin. But, aside from that, these people actually believe that the God that breathed into the earth and created man doesn't have the power to make a man holy. Do you realize that? Okay, that is insane. That shows lack of faith, lack of a relationship with God, lack of actually an encounter with God, because if you encountered God, you would understand the power of God. And it would have already been made manifest in your life, basically, right? Another thing, Philippians 1.6, Being confident of this very thing, he that began a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Therefore, denying the regenerating power of God, denying that God begins to actually make you holy after you're converted, is not even biblical because it says right here, that the guy who began a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The guy who began a good work in us is God the Father, and he will be perform that work until the day 
of Jesus Christ. He's doing the work. The Father's doing the work, okay? He's the one that chose and elected those who come onto the Son, right? So if you don't believe in that regenerating power, you're a false convert. God has never done a real work in your life, and you need to repent, and you need to come to a different view of the Bible. Try going and reading the whole New Testament ten times in context and keeping that view that you do not have to walk in holiness. Okay? Number five. The number five reason people, believers, remain in their sin. And guys, you can work on any of these issues. If any of these issues ring true in your life and you're in your sin, and I'm reading these issues and you feel convicted, you better fix it. That's why I'm doing this video. I'm not doing the video to, to bring wrath against you, to make you feel upset. I'm doing it so you can get right with God and live a life pleasing to God and you can see God when you leave this earth, okay? That's the goal. The goal is because I love you, not because I'm trying to make Christianity hard for you. I didn't make up these rules. If I made the rules, I'd be face down drunk in a bar somewhere, partying, doing whatever I wanted, drugs, whatever kind of excess I wanted, okay? I don't make these rules. I've just seen this change thousands and thousands of people's lives. I've seen too much good fruit come into people's lives who actually heed these words and follow them to not teach them to other people. Number five, lack of private prayer life and fasting. This is one thing I started out, I had an excellent prayer life. I carried that out for a couple years. For, for a while I got off, I got too busy and I wasn't praying as much. Now I'm praying more than ever. Uh, I, I, I realized that it was ruining me, do you understand? And uh, it's not that I didn't pray, I prayed, but I prayed on my time while I was carrying out what I felt I needed to do. And I got into a place where I was doing too much of what I felt I needed to do rather than sitting down and asking God, hey, what do you want from me? What do you want me to change right now? What do you want me to do right now? So you need to do this. You need to set aside time to do this, right? You don't just do this in passing. You need to actually sacrifice your time to do this properly. Meaning something you would normally run to do, don't. Walk away and do this. Private prayer and fasting, okay? Now, fa everyone's going to be able to fast at different levels. I'm, this really isn't about fasting. I'm going to talk about it a little bit, but um, that's not the focus here. The focus is prayer this time, all right? But Luke 5, 15 and 16 says, But so much more his fame spread abroad, and great multitudes came together to hear and were healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness, into the wilderness and he prayed. That's talking about Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus Christ... He was doing all these great things, yet he always took time, many times in the Bible, to stop and take a walk and talk to his God and Father, the Most High God, okay? That is what you need to do. You need to stop and take a walk and talk to the Most High God, or you talk to Jesus Christ and his Father, whatever you want. As long as you know they're not the same person, that's fine with me. But you go take a walk, you talk to the Father, the Son, or even the Holy Spirit if you want, and you actually ask them, what's wrong with me? What can I change about myself? See, this will keep you in your sin. If you're not doing this, you will be blind to certain sins, absolutely. And if you're doing this, you may still be blind to certain sins. If you're not doing it wholeheartedly and constantly doing it and genuinely doing it, because Satan's power to deceive is strong, people. It's very strong. And it could deceive the best, and it has deceived all the best, except for Jesus Christ. It's deceived all the best. All the men of God you look up to on this earth have been deceived by Satan from getting too far from God. I've heard testimonies. I've seen it. 
If they're not repenting, I see their sins playing out in real life, and it just always is taking place. So if you look up to any man on this earth and you take your Bible lessons from that man, you better realize that even that man is deceived by the devil in some areas, and you better walk with fear and trembling, and you better get right. Jesus instructed us to pray. Matthew 6, 5 to 13. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and in the corners of the streets. Many churches start off like this. It's like a prayer on a timer. Everyone pray now, and then everyone prays. Sit oh, dear Jesus, oh, Jesus, yes, oh, no, 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 praise the Lord. Pray. It's ridiculous, okay? You don't always need to pray like that, and 99% of those people doing that, there, if you got to pray because some other guy told you to pray, you're in big trouble. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with corporate prayer in church. That's fine. But if it's not genuine, right, which most times the situation I'm talking about isn't. I've been, I've been in a church one time, and uh, I was up in this church up in the middle of nowhere somewhere, and they were doing that. They were having prayer and worship time. And there was always this one guy that would, like, jump out in front of everybody and fall on his face, you know, fall face down. And, you know, he's bowing, he's bowing, he's crying and weeping and all that. You know, that's the guy that got caught masturbating later on that month in the church. It didn't surprise me in the least. Because while I'm watching it, I'm like, what is this? Is this guy falling down on cue? Praying in front of other people for the approval of men. God hates it. God despises people that do that. God despises, with a passion, people that care for the approval of men more than the approval of God. Okay? Jesus goes on to say, Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What does, he, what does he mean? He means people looking up to you when you go and pray in front of them, and people thinking you're a great prayer warrior, or a great man of God, or a lover of God because you pray in front of men. That's your reward. That's what he's saying. You have your reward. You got it already in this world from men. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that there's no man that can give me any kind of reward that I'm looking for. I've, I've lived all those kind of rewards already. I'm looking for the stuff that, that doesn't wax old, that moths cannot corrupt. I'm looking for those everlasting blessings and relationships with the Father and the Son. Do you understand? Now... This is so common in Christianity, it's ridiculous. I mean, a lot of times, people come here, and they visit me, and they just want me to pray like a dancing clown. And I, I say to myself, and they pray, and then they want me to pray, and then they want to say a prayer, and then they want me to say one. And I say to myself, don't you people know I pray all, all the time? And if I'm not praying, I'm resisting my sin all the time, and I'm talking to God all the time about what you what, what's going on in my life. You know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's it's aggravating, really. It's aggra It shows me that people don't pray enough when they come here and they have to pray all, every five seconds. Every five seconds of protection from God. You don't need that much to pray for that much protection from God if you walk in righteousness and you obey Him and you have a relationship with Him. You don't need to walk around the corner and say, Father, put your angel around the corner so a demon doesn't stab me in the head as I walk around the corner. If you do the right things, you don't have to fear for your own protection. Do you understand? Do your prayer in private and you will have protection everywhere you walk. Okay? And if you're walking strong with God, like I was saying earlier, and you come just a little bit out of that protection, you feel it. You feel it hard. And I don't know about you guys, but stuff gets rough for me real quick when I get a little too far from God. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and, they, and thy Father which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. How will he reward people? Good fruit, blessings, discernment, growth in Christ, growth in humility. Not with a megachurch. 
He may reward you with the church and a ministry and all this stuff, and he may actually make your ministry big. But you're not going to be smothered in riches. That's not the kind of reward they're talking about right here. Things are going to be hard. You've got to struggle to get it done. When you see a man of God basking in the riches real easily, that guy's ready for a big fall. Those blessings, many times they start off by God giving and they end off by the devil giving in excess. And then the, the man of God gets deceived because he thinks because, he's, because God started the process of blessing his ministry and the devil is finishing it, that it's all from God. He fails to go and pray and realize, hey, this part of it, the Satan picked up the difference right here. And you don't want this kind of blessing. Sometimes I have people call me up and they tell me, Hey, Chris, you know, I want to meet with you about what you teach, and I want to donate to your ministry. And I say to myself, If you want to donate to my ministry, donate. I'm not, I don't need to meet with you about what I teach. What, do you want to influence what I teach with your bag of money? No, I don't want your bag of money if you want to influence what I teach. Give it or don't. Just give it or don't. If God's not leading you to give it, what I say doesn't matter. You people understand what I'm saying? Because that kind of thing, you got to be careful where your blessings are coming from. Like some people, it's funny, like some, some demonic people and Satanists and stuff, they like to clown around by uh, donating to the ministry uh, six, uh, 666, right? $66 and uh 60 cents or something like they do it one one way or another i forget oh six or six oh and i say to myself these people are so stupid as long as i didn't make any agreements with them i'm going to take their money and use it for the work of god they could send it all they want 666 i'll take a million people 666 and i'll just spend all the money on ministry work you people could send it all you want as long as I got nothing to do with you and you got no hold on my mind, you're not intimidating me by doing that. I'm taking the money and I'm using it. If you got a problem with it, you could come here and talk to me directly and not send those donations. Be ye not therefore like unto those hypocrites as the heathen pray from much speaking. So when you go in private to God, and you pray to God, you basically talk to him like you would your own father on this earth or somebody you greatly respect. And if you walked up to George Bush or a president, not like most Christians don't respect those people at all, but I'm just making an example. If you walked up to a president or uh, a prime minister or some respectable person of authority, you wouldn't say... Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, George, thank you, thank you, thank you. You would talk to them like a human being, and you would talk to them like a normal person. And that's how God wants you to talk to him. He doesn't want you to ask him something 50 times because it says he knows what you have need of before you ask for it right here in this verse. Then Jesus goes on, and he directs them, he directs them to pray the Our Father. Father, which are, it, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who brought debts against us. And lead us not into temptation. You're asking God to lead you not into temptation, which means he's the one that controls the whole thing. And he's the one that has power to lead you into temptation. But deliver you from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This prayer is the foundation of what Jesus Christ told everyone to pray. Okay? To forgive us. To deliver us right that's that's this is the main factor do you understand forgiveness deliverance of sin forgiving other people do you understand all this is the main key points that Jesus taught us to pray and if you're going to get into fasting Isaiah 58 6 is not this fast a fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens 
and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke, right? So this clearly states that there is a kind of fast that we could fast that is not a fast that he chose. If the fast is so you can get what you want, it's not a fast that he chose. The fast needs to be for you to break the bonds of wickedness in yourself, for you to submit to God. And, he, and one I like also is you go and seek the Lord for your calling. Jesus went on a long fast before he began to carry out his work. What he was doing is he was getting tempted by the devil, yes, but he was also preparing for his calling and in communion with the Father, right? So, that is very important. Fast for the right purposes and the prayer relationship. If you don't have it, if you, at least the prayer relationship, if you don't have the prayer relationship, you are going to be missing sin. Number six, this is big, not coming separate from the world and worldly people. If you do not want to come separate from unbelievers, you are finished. You will be dragged back into carnality like a fool. That is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. And the world will be trying to drag you back in. Old friends, family will try to drag you back in. And if you allow it to happen, you are a complete fool. Just the bottom line. And I, I just want to read this verse in 1 Corinthians 5.11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or extortioner. With such a one do not even eat. Now this is for a brother. Imagine an unbeliever that does these sins. You should not be messing with these people. You should not be in constant fellowship with these people. Now if you want to sit down and you want to minister to one of these people and you want to uh, break bread with them and minister the gospel to them, that's, that's okay. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about you partaking in their sins. That's what it's talking about. And if a man is called a brother, you have partaken in his sins because you're calling him a brother. So that works for the unbeliever also. So if it works for the brother, it works for the unbeliever. Because a brother, you're actually standing with that man and taking a public stance that you're in agreement with that man if you're calling him a brother. Do you understand? And if you keep on hanging out with a worldly person, you are absolutely stepping into agreement with, the, with those people. Now, I have relations with people that are unbelievers. Arm's length relations where I constantly proclaim Christ. But I do not take my private time and, and socialize with them and enjoy their company in that way. Do you understand? Because I know people are going to turn around and try and say, Jesus sat with sinners. Well, yes, he sat with them to deliver the truth to them that they may be converted. Did he sit with them to get high? Did he sit with them to get drunk? Answer my question. Did he? No, he didn't. So people should not be using that as an excuse. 1 John 2.16 For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... And the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This is calling us out of the world. I ask everyone, do you really think that you can linger around people sinning for extended amounts of time for, without falling to the works of Satan? Satan leans on people with time and effort. I've seen, peop I've seen Satan crush people by other people leaning on them and putting pressure on them over a prolonged amount of time to where they almost drove Christians insane. And if you're not smart enough to nip that in the bud and you put up with it and you put up with it, you're, you're going down. Don't tempt the devil to tempt you. You will remain in your sin. If anyone's watching this and you have fellowship with willful outward sinners, 
Do you understand? I mean people getting drunk, people smoking marijuana. Don't think you're going to heaven. Don't think you are going to make it if you associate on a repeated basis and choose to spend your time with people like that and you enjoy spending your time people with people like that. You're never going to make it. No way. Number seven. You're too proud to confess sins to your brethren. This is a big reason people remain in their sins because God will not deliver you out of certain sins until you come clean and you come public with that sin. There are many times I repent for sin in my life that I'm allowed to do it privately. And there's other times where it's too serious to not do it publicly, to set a standard and make a testimony for the goodness of God. Do you understand? So, so I'm not saying every time you are forgiven for sins, you have to confess it to brethren or you have to confess it publicly. Some sins may be shameful, may make people view your marriage in a different light like that. I would understand maybe sometimes if People like that would just want to confess that to a pastor or maybe just their spouse, and they can both repent to God. There's different circumstances, but I'm a true believer in no matter what the sin is and who's involved in it, it's always best to do it openly because it shows that you don't care about the approval of men. It shows that you're not a proud person. It shows that you're not high-minded. It shows that you're willing to be brought low and you're willing to let God lift you up. So there's been many people in my walk that they'll, that they'll say, well, I don't give my testimony because it's shameful. And I turn around and say, well, was it not shameful when I had to get up, when I had a successful life and I was a business person and came from a wealthy family and I had to go tell people I was... Uh, a masturbator, a drug user, a drug dealer. You don't think that's shameful? You don't think that was hard to do? That was very hard to do. I just read what the Bible said and I did it. Man. James 5.16 Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Right here, we're commanded to confess our faults one to another. Okay? If you can't confess them to your brethren, you got troubles. You're proud. You're ashamed. Number eight. Too blind to see your own demons. Refusal to submit for deliverance prayer. The biggest culprits are people that don't think they have demons. Obviously, you don't want to submit for deliverance prayer if you don't think you have demons. And I'll tell you what, you will not come out of your sin. Sometimes you can do all the other things on this 10-point list I'm listing. But if you will not come to the table to get those demons cast out, you will never get the root. You will not get the root. You can try. I've seen people dance around trying to get delivered every other way but coming in to get them cast out. You know why? Because they're afraid. They're afraid of the deliverance. And I understand. When I came to Christ, you people know how afraid I was to get delivered. I was so afraid that... Let me, let me put it this way. I was so demonized and afraid that I was driving to the church... Me, Brother Chris, was driving to the church in my car. And the demons that had me were trying to turn, using my own hands, to turn the car around and destroy the GPS. And it took me three weeks to actually get to the front door of the church to get my first deliverance. And it took me about 30 minutes to walk into the door... And the second I walked into the door, I exploded into a manifestation and attempted to kill and attack everyone in the church. So you don't have to tell me about being afraid of deliverance because I went from flight 
to fight when I went into the church. I was flighting, flighting, flighting. I was afraid. It wasn't me that was afraid. It was what was in me to walk into the church. Because those devils that were in me knew me well. They were familiar with me. And they knew that if I saw the power of God, no, no devil would ever be able to stop me from pursuing that power of God. And uh, your demons know that too. And many times the more valuable you are going to be to God, the more you are going to be attacked right before your deliverance. I was just talking to a good brother the other day who I, I, I love him and I've been watching him uh, for a while now struggle to just come out and ask me for deliverance. And I knew God was working with him and I was going to give it time. And he, would, he, he, he keeps telling me different things, right? Different things like, yeah, man, I don't know why it's so hard. I just can't figure out how to beat them. And I'll talk to you later. And hey, man, they, they attacked me again, but I'll get over it myself. Don't worry. And the whole time I know he, he, he wants deliverance, right? But I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till the right time for God to work on him to ask for it. And this is, this is a good friend of mine. And he called, I finally, I finally, he went so far where he got close enough to asking me for the deliverance where I just said, hey, I'm going to make time Friday to pray for you. I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to pray for you because you're a good friend of mine. And I've known you for a while now. So Friday came and he would never miss an appointment. I know him. And I, I wrote him on the email. I said, I'm ready. I'll, I'll call you on a side Skype so other people don't barge into the Skype. And uh, no response. And I'm like, hmm, that's weird. I thought my discernment was right on, that this guy needed deliverance bad. He was ready. He was actually said, yes, let's do it. And he doesn't pick up. I said, what happened? So the n next day I was busy, didn't write him. Next day I think I was busy too, couldn't, couldn't find out what happened. On the third day, I contacted him, and I was like, Hey, man, like, I know you wanted to set up the time on Friday for prayer. You didn't show up. Are you okay? I don't get an answer for a while, and then I get an answer, like, maybe 10 hours later or a day later. And he's, I think it was that long, at least. But um, he goes, Man, I don't know what happened, but I was on my way home the day I was supposed to get prayer, and I went off the median, and the car rolled, and I flipped, and I broke my collarbone, and all this stuff. He's all right, thank God. But I just it just reminded me of what I went through to try and get to the church to get help. And the fact that that car flipped over, and the fact that all that happened, just shows me all the more that the time is nigh for you demons. In that man, the time is nigh. If he's watching, the time is nigh. You're finished. You know what's coming down the road for you. And when someone's about to submit for deliverance prayer, believe me, guys, those demons are sitting in a person. For me, my demons sat in me completely comfortable until the day God intervened. Completely confident that God would never come for a reprobate like me, a wicked, wicked, vile, evil person, and loving it, loving it to the point where it's sold out to evil. Do you understand? My demons did not see the day coming of my, my inter, inter, intervention from Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I mean? Whatever you want to call it. The day that lamb came into my life, those demons erupted. They changed their phase. The phase went, in, went from convincing me I'm a god and a powerhouse and a, and a witch and could astral project and could read minds and all that, to we are going to kill you and kill you quick and we are not going to let you get close to the truth. We are going to burn your mind with electricity. We are going to gang stalk you. We are going to destroy you, torment you, cause physical pain almost put you in a mental hospital, all that, and much, much more, paralyzed with fear, in the day and in the night, all the time, four months, three months minimum, big time, and it, it dragged out for a year, but the, the, the part where it was uncontrollable was a year, so the thing that, that, fe that made them fear the most was this right here, this was what brought me out of the deepest level of sin 
at the quickest pace, blind to my own demons, and rushing to submit for deliverance prayer. And it took me a while to humble myself, to go to another man, because I was the type of guy, I needed help from no one. If I needed money, I'd work, I'd work in a job, or I'd deal drugs, whichever one would bring in the quickest money. Or I would fight, or I would try and attack somebody, or, do, or get into a bar brawl. But everything was something I was going to take control of myself. And when I gave my life to God, there came a time where I had to actually go to a stranger, someone I don't even know, and say, I am in desperate need of your help and that was the first stage of my humbling and they liked me so much they asked me to give my testimony and i was casting demons out of other people powerfully even as a babe and they asked me to give my testimony and that was the next level of humbling that i had to go through and when i ask people for testimonies and they don't give them i just say to myself you are never going to get where you can be being too proud to give your testimony. And I'll say the same thing about people that don't want to submit and get demons cast out and don't want people to see them foaming and see them snarling and see them drooling. You people will never get where you need to be until you humble yourself and actually allow those wicked beasts that are living in your flesh to begin to purge out of your flesh. And they will use that pride to stay in your flesh. They absolutely will. And it will work. If you agree with it, they are not coming out. They are going to make a joke of you. You could go say your twinkle, twinkle, little star prayer somewhere. God, help me. I love you. I'm ready to turn from my sin. And if you feel that devil in you and it's dwelling, just know right now, it is not coming out every time by you just doing that kind of prayer. Now, some will, but they all won't. They definitely all won't because God is well pleased by people humbling themselves and turning to other people for prayer. I got to do it. Everyone here has got to do it. There's not a person living here right now that does not humble themselves for prayer. And there's not a person that's part of my in inner circle that if they don't humble themselves for prayer they will not they will not last that's good coconut water sorry I'm gonna try and calm down now number nine inadequate time studying God's Word. This is, this is a big one. It's more important when the Word's not living in you. When the Word's living in you, it's still important, but it's way more important when the Word's not living in you to be studying God's Word. Because anybody that's been a Christian more than two years, or more than even six months, I should say, will know the further you get from the written Word, the further you are going to get into your sin by default and ungodly characteristics. Many ministries, the biggest one I see, people that don't read the Bible a lot, is jesting. Right there in the ministry headship. I'm not going to lie. In this ministry, when this ministry started, we would joke around with each other until everyone realized it was so demonic. You'll see a video, go back and watch a video where I confess to the world I got a demon in me that jokes around all the time. I dealt with those demons. I had a lot of I had more than one. I would get one out and stop saying goofy jokes and, and, and like kind of just like weird jokes. Then I would say kind of friendly jokes. So I got rid of that first demon. Now it's just friendly joking. Then it's just mild jesting. And God works on you until it's gone. And some of these ministries, especially on the internet, you could see them jesting right in their sermons. You'll see Joseph Prince and, and uh, Joel Osteen and Creflo Dollar and those, those people, they'll crack jokes right before the message. Right in from God's altar, they will crack a joke. Okay? That ain't the way to be preaching the Word of God. And worldly jokes... 
Like, oh, I wish the Dallas Cowboys could have picked up their panties last night. Like, something like that. They'll be preaching in Dallas or something. They'll try and use worldly things like sports to get the crowd going. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Come on, double up on that and give praise to Jesus. Amen, amen. Just hold your positions just for a while. We need to pray just for a while, okay, because it's very important we pray this. Father, according to the riches of your goodness and grace, let the Astros win. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, God is good. It's like a Coliseum Carnival clown show. Every kind of C word you could imagine. It's a clown show, okay? It's a complete joke. It's a circus. Coliseum, clown show, circus. And you know what, guys? It's just not going to last. The party's going to come to an end for all these people who want to joke around on God's pulpit and do foolish things and let women get behind God's pulpit. There was a guy I watched, I, I watched some, I don't watch him much, I watched him a couple times because a brother of mine uh, showed him to me. And he was doing something like I'm doing here, building a church. And the thing that I, I've been so sick, the thing I feared the most uh, happening to me actually happened to this brother. And I'm completely sorry to hear that it happened to this brother. Because he taught a good message, but he taught a racist, you know, the blacks are the real Hebrews gospel. And he made black people feel like they're more special than other people. But he taught a very good message. But this guy passed away, dropped dead working on this sanctuary. God rest his soul. And uh, guess what happened? His daughter and his wife got up on the pulpit after he died. No one seems to f find a problem with it that's watching his ministry. Oh, because a guy dies and everyone feels bad, you let his wife get up on the pulpit? you got to be kidding me. I told another brother today, if I die, if something happens to me, and this church is running over here and a woman gets behind it, I want you to take one of my cameras, take a can of gasoline, and burn the church down. And I'm serious. And if I die and anyone has this video... I want you to send that to whoever's running this church. This church needs to be burnt down if a woman gets behind the pulpit. Because Jezebel is not going to preach from a pulpit that I work to build on if I could help it. No way. If a man of God is a good man of God, he'll raise up a man or he'll coordinate another man to take his place should there not be another man fit at his location to take his place. There's, a, there's young people here that I've talked to about what, what should happen to me if I get sick and something should happen to me. And the people they should call and give control of this church to now. And I'm not, I don't contact too many of those people now. But there are people that I know are doing the right thing from a distance that would get control of this place if there wasn't somebody here fit to take it over. Do you understand? But... Again, I don't know how I got on that, but uh, I'm just going to finish this out because I keep going off. There's a lot of things the Lord led me to say. I just want to read the last one, and then if I have anything else that he wants me to say, uh, we could talk about it then. Number 10 reason, believing that faith without obedience is suitable to appease God's wrath, underestimating the judgment of the believer and the severity of God. These are reasons people remain in their sin. This is might be, this might be one of the biggest reasons that's why I saved it for last. I'm going to read it again. Believing that faith without obedience is suitable to appease God's wrath, they underestimate the judgment of the believer and the severity of God. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time has come that judgment must begin with the house of God. 
And if it first begins with us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God be? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's serious. Judgment begins with us. Your faith without your obedience will be judged, and your disobedience with your faith will be condemned. Do you understand that? Read your scriptures. I'm going to go to war with cheap grace gospel until the day I die. I've been doing it since the beginning. I'm going to do it every day in my life until the day I die. Because I made a video about the biggest dangers to Christianity, and I believe that was one of them. The cheap grace, faith alone, people that remove repentance, are the biggest enemies that I see today of the cross of Christ and the Lordship of Christ. Luke 12, 46-48 The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. Notice the Lord's coming for the servant, not the unbeliever. So the Lord comes for the servant in the day he looks not. That's us. At an hour when he's not aware. That's us. And cuts him asunder. He's cutting some of us asunder. Because we're the servants, right? And will appoint him, and this is more proof that it's not unbelievers, he will appoint the servant his portion with the unbeliever. Okay? So he wasn't talking about unbelievers from the get-go. So he's going to appoint the servant the portion with the unbeliever. Okay? Which is hellfire and brimstone, weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the worm dies not and the fire is never quenched. Do you understand? And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and this scares me because I know, I know what he wants me to do most of the time. It scares me. The one who knew his will and prepared not himself, you didn't prepare yourself, you didn't refine yourself, you didn't grow in grace, you didn't grow in love, you didn't grow in fear of God, you didn't grow in godly character. You didn't repent. You didn't prepare yourself. That man neither, neither did according to his will and shall be beaten with many stripes. So those who know are beaten with more stripes than the unbeliever, than the heathen, than the Gentile in heart. The circumcised Jew in heart who knows his Lord's will and does it not, will be beaten with multiple times more stripes for life, for, for eternity, than the, than the unbeliever heathen. And his, his, his judgment will be appointed the same unto him as it was the unbeliever, according to this. But he that knew his Lord's will and did not commit things worthy of stripes... But he that knew not and did not commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. So the one that didn't even know Jesus Christ and did commit things worthy of stripes, meaning some crack-smoking whack job on the side of the road who robbed a store for a television or a VCR is going to be beaten less than you watcher of my channel and this video if you know God's will and you don't obey him. A crackhead robbing a TV out of a storefront in Spanish Harlem is going to be beaten with less stripes than you if you're walking in sin intentionally and God has revealed your sin to you and you walk in it intentionally. For unto whom much is given, this scares me too, I've received more grace from God than almost anybody I know that's breathing on this planet today. It may seem that there's other ministers or, or men of God that do God's work to you guys that, that have these big ministries, but in my own eyes, and I see what God did to me, I've received more grace than anybody I see, and I know a lot of people ministering, almost every public minister I've seen, almost every one. 
I haven't seen all the little ones doing the work in secret, who are going to get an even greater reward. But of the people who God has blessed in their character and the rate of change and blessings with family and, and the, the fruit he's allowed me to bear through my work for him, I have been given so much, so I fear much. Because you know why? Because to, hit, to whom much is given, much is required. Much is required. If you know the truth of Jesus Christ and you've been delivered the, the word and the good word of the gospel, and you've been delivered that truth, you are one out of a thousand on this earth. To, mu to whom much is given, much is expected. The more authority you step, in, step to, and the more power God gives you in his kingdom, and that's people, that's God sending you people that listen to you and call you their leader and take your advice and they call you their pastor, your evan their evangelist, whatever. That's taking authority. When you start to get into that level, the people who should fear God the most are the people that teach the Bible. There were many people that I, that I had interactions with that I did not like what they were teaching that I've seen get up on YouTube, start a ministry, and come to dust, come to complete dust. And it's because they didn't do the will of the Father, they didn't fear God. Because to whom much is given, much is required, and to whom men have committed much, here we go again. So, I'm up on here making videos. If you're watching me, you've committed to me the responsibility of bringing you a good doctrine. You've committed to me the responsibility of watching over your souls, like the Bible says. I watch over your soul, like the, like the Word of God says. And I should be able to do it without grief, like that, like that passage says. But I, like that passage says, have to be accountable to God. And I'm going to post that passage below, if it's not already there. Do you understand? Because when I go to bed at night, I am accountable to God, and this says, to whom much men have committed much, to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask them more. And they do. They do. If I pray for somebody on that, that's why I gotta hide sometimes, because I'll answer an email, and it's a blessing, I, I could help somebody, and they ask another question. And then I ask it, answer an email, and they ask another question. And then I ask and they e answer another email and they ask another question. I answer that one, they ask another question. Until I just stop answering them, that I'll get questions forever from a thousand people. And that's why it's, it's profitable many times for people to have a local ministry where people could begin to delegate out authority, like, like what happened with Moses, where, where Moses couldn't handle all the people after a while. You can't delegate to so many thousands of people, which is interesting, and I think I made my point on this, which is interesting because so many ministries today, they want to have massive, massive ministries. And if there was a time in my walk that I wanted to have a massive, massive ministry where thousands of people are filling a church building and I'm responsible for it, that day has come to an end. I'm not going to say that I won't do it, because I will do whatever God wants me to do. But I don't think it's genuine to have that constant, that constant goal. Like, I watched a video the other day of Todd White standing next to Kenneth Copeland. These guys are trying to buy like a, like a multi-million dollar complex. Please... Please give me a break. You don't need more than a $350,000 building or a $500,000 building. You're all over the internet. Why do these people need tennis courts, football fields? Air Kenneth Copeland's got an airport. Todd White's sitting there with him. Todd White sold out a long time ago. He, was, he began sold out. I made a video about those guys. And everyone came up against me, Todd White's legit, Chris. Why'd you make this video? Why'd I make the video? Well, what do you have to say now? He's standing next to Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland is guilting everybody to give him money. Guilting everybody, telling the people, saying, Oh, could you imagine, Todd, if people didn't take the chance to 
donate to the Apostle Paul's ministry, how stupid that would be, insinuating that if they don't donate to Todd White's ministry, they're in big trouble and they're stupid and losing a great opportunity. And Todd White's just sitting there saying, I can't even believe I got in bed with a devil like this, but now I'm in bed with him and there ain't nothing I could do about it. Because guess what? Kenneth Copeland ain't coming to talk about promoting that guy's church if that guy already doesn't have a hook into his neck with money. And that's just the way it is. And anybody going on the 700 dopey club and all those other stupid dopey shows, you people are, you people have no idea. You're getting in bed with people who all they care about is making money and making money and making money. That's all they care about, those three things. Making money, making money, and making money. And they don't care if you're really a sinner in secret. They don't care if you're trying to build your kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. Because when you have to keep proposing new ventures every week, well, now we're going to start a church here. And that church isn't well run. We have no footage of that church operating on a high level. And we have no footage of your conquest of Maine. And we have no footage of your conquest of Jamaica. And we have no footage of all these conquests. Just you constantly proposing all these things that you're going to build your kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what these people are doing. And, you know, when I started out in ministry, I wanted to have an international ministry in the first year. And I wanted to do all those things. And as I went into ministry, a healthy thing for a minister is to want to be able to see good fruit and quality, not quantity. That's a healthy goal for a minister. I had a dear brother once, he might be watching right now, who told me, you should name the website BDS International. And then I, I told him, I said, no, let's name it BDS Corsicana. Let's, let's just name it, with, this is going to be more than we could deal with. Let's just name it BDS Corsicana. It'll be the small ministry that has big reach. Unless God wants to really do his own thing with it, then we'll deal with it then. But right now, let's just bite what we could chew. And I watched, I watched my dear brother struggle with this. Like, no, BDS International. But inter well, we're, we're already international. Well, yeah, we're already international on YouTube. But, but we could be international on YouTube without putting flags up in the back. And we could be international on YouTube without calling our ministry BDS International. And we could be BDS without making t-shirts with the word BDS on them and making hats and selling them. And this brother didn't want to do that, but, but other ministries are doing that. We could be BDS and not make a movie exalting ourselves. We could be BDS and not make it like BDS is the only way to bring deliverance to the nations, that we're the ones bringing it to the nations. Because people were doing deliverance, healing, and all these other things long before anybody that's breathing today came around. There was, oh, God always had people on earth from the time Jesus Christ hit the scene. Do you understand? There were always a select few that were willing to step out in faith and believe the Bible and heal and deliver. Do you understand? And nobody should make it like they are bringing this to the world. You can teach it to the world, and you can teach it in a deeper truth. And I believe many men, including myself, and many of them that are dead, and some that are alive, have brought a deeper understanding of deliverance ministry to the world. Because the Bible didn't talk much about dealing with the legions. There was one verse where Jesus cast legions out, the Bible didn't talk about the heavy demonization of the witchcraft that goes on and all those things. And there are men that could actually bring an extra revelation than the Bible. But once you get to these other issues like healing and stuff, healing is nothing more than your faith and, and your sonship in Christ and going up and saying, Father, heal my brother in Jesus Christ's name. That's all there is to it. 
And there's many people that are going around teaching deliverance is the same and deliverance is not the same. And the Bible teaches many ways that deliverance happens. The Bible teaches many ways. Sometimes you have to resist them. Sometimes you have to fast. Sometimes you have to cast them out. Sometimes there's more than one. And that's all in the Bible. But the Bible was not specific about a lot of that stuff. And what? who do you want to go to to get that information from? You want to go, go to somebody that was delivered of many demons and someone that's overcome many demons and someone that's lived it and someone that's been called by God and someone that's proven all of that in real life and does it all the time. And you don't want to take advice from anybody. You know, deliverance of demons is an issue that almost everyone that holds a Bible is teaching about. They walk around... They walk around with their Bible like this. No, that's not how you do deliverance. Well, have you ever cast out a demon? No, but it says right here, uh, says right here that uh, Jesus did it in one word. It says right here Jesus did it in one word. He cast him out with a word. Okay, friend. Well, you take your Bible. I'm going to bring you some demonized people. And I'll be one of them. You come over here, you cast demons out of me, and I'll bring you a thousand other people. And I want to see you hold your Bible and cast demons out of everybody with a word. And I'm not talking about the people falling down the floor and fainting. I want to see demons tearing out of their flesh. I want to see them expelling demons. Do you understand? That's what I want to see. Because many of these people that are talking about deliverance. I have good friends that went a lot to a lot of these ministries. And this video went way off the rails, but it, it doesn't really matter. I gotta say what I'm led to say. Many people went to many of these ministries, these so-called men that teach deliverance. And they were heavily demonized, and they went up to these guys. And they told them they were demonized, and these guys prayed for them for five minutes. And after they were not delivered, the people told them, well, you just got to renew your mind, or you just got to, uh, you're free, you're free, it's all in your head, or you don't have a demon, you're pretending. People I know very well that really, I mean, I've struggled with dear brothers against demons sometimes for very many years, some demons, and we get victory many times, even struggling that long. Many of them come out in an instant, in an instant. But you guys have to be careful because many people who are just holding a Bible teach you things. And they have no experience on the matter. They have absolutely no experience on the matter. And the demon issue will bring even the, the even Christians that think they know a lot. It will humble them so much. I've seen Christians who thought they were so close to God encounter deliverance ministry for the first time walk up to demonized people, command demons out of people, and the demon laughs in their face. And it's just a beautiful thing to watch their smile turn upside down and watch the work of God begin working in them, that they're not what they thought they were. And then when you turn around, and demons have done it to me, don't get me wrong. There's been times in my walk, especially when I first started, you know, we ain't coming out, sorry, you don't have the authority. I have the authority, I have the authority. No, you don't. We ain't coming out. Six hours later. Because you think praying a long time means you're going to get them out. And sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't. See, that's, that's another thing people don't know. They'll teach you if you, if you don't pray. If you pray for six hours, they're always going to come out. No, sometimes you just don't have the, the power and the person doesn't have the repentance in line to get them out. It's a struggle. It's a real struggle sometimes. And people are going to see that, and we're going to show it. People are going to see people struggle with demons. We're going to struggle against to get some demons out in this church. And when, when, when I feel led to put it on video, people are going to see how grueling it is. Grueling. Some of these churches, you'll, you'll see the other, some of the other deliverance ministers, and there are other good deliverance ministers uh, around. There are a couple. I would say there's about, I would say, ten 
tops decent deliverance ministries in the United States. Decent. Some better than others. Maybe three that are really, really on point in, in the United States. And uh, you'll see they'll, they struggle sometimes, and sometimes they come out instantly. And it makes people wonder who, who have never been around deliverance ministry. It's like, why is it this way? Why is it this way? Well, it's because of the kingdoms built up in the people, the legions. And the Bible says there are powers, principalities, rulers. And there's an entire spirit world that wars for souls. Do you understand? And uh, that brings me back to the topic of you turning from your sin. Make no mistake about it, the biggest agenda of the demons is to keep you from repenting of sin. You see, there's people on this earth that will cast out demons and go to hell. There's people on this earth that will have faith that Jesus Christ died on that cross and they will go to hell. But nobody that submits themselves submits themselves to God and repents of their sin and obeys God is going to go to hell nobody every one of those people will see eternal life many will cast out devils and he'll say i never knew you many that is written many will have faith and faith without works is dead and faith without obedience is dead. Many will have works without obedience, and then they're dead. Obedience is key. Many will have sacrifice without obedience and repentance. Repentance and obedience to me is the same word. Because if you're obeying God, you'll be in a state of repentance all the time. Do you understand? Nobody with obedience is going to hell. Everybody with obedience is going to heaven. Praise God. Because without obedience, you have no faith, and you don't love God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because if you have faith in the written word, you're going to obey those words, every one. You're not going to take some and leave out the others. If you have faith in God's word, you have faith in the storyline of God's word. Not just one Bible verse, or one group of Bible verses, or cherry-picked Bible verses. You have faith in the story that was given to us by holy men moved by God. And you conform your life to every single word that is written in that book. And when those people believed in Jesus Christ in the book of Acts, they burnt their witchcraft books and rejoiced. They didn't keep them and say, by my faith, I'm justified. They burnt them. They burnt their occultic stuff. They burnt their stupid Christmas trees and their pathetic little sissified homosexual Valentine's Day decorations and their faggoty little Easter bunnies and all the rest. And, you know, that's one issue that, that when you come to Christ, letting go of those holidays and all that stuff, that's what starts tearing up families. That was the one thing that completely ended my seven-year relationship with a woman I was engaged to marry. I would not celebrate Christmas anymore, and I would not partake in their Greek Easter anymore. And after she watched me deal heroin and and do all different stuff and deal oxycotton she basically said that was cool but you're not going to you're not going to play with the easter bunny i'm done with you i'm done with you and uh i understand i understand because when you let go of that kind of stuff you're coming out of the world that's where people draw the line and many people are going to watch this and be like, a Christian could still celebrate Christmas. A Christmas, so. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. If you want to be involved in a vain tradition of men, yeah. Yeah, if you want to be involved in that. If you want to walk on that carnal level, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, 
The video is called 10 Reasons Believers Remain in Sin. And I think it became 10 stupid things I see people doing all over the internet today. But you guys be blessed. I love you. We're fighting here every day to do the best we can. And everyone's been a big help. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people have been a big help. And we appreciate you all. And God bless you and have a good night.